Great. First of all, Chris, uh, big thanks for taking the time. It's fantastic to have you on. You run a, an amazing company. You are the biggest employer in the world. Uh, you know, you kind of churn out uh, four and a half thousand burgers every minute and, and six and a half million burgers every day. So uh, before we kick off properly, what is your favorite McDonald's meal? Uh, well, you've got to go different parts of the day, different meals. So yeah. breakfast for me, I love the Egg McMuffin. Uh, it's a classic. Uh, for lunch, I'd say the Quarter Pounder here in the U.S. is a great burger. Love the Quarter Pounder, but also uh, a fan of the McChicken. Uh, so those would be my uh, probably go-to items. And of course, love our uh, McDonald's French fries. Absolutely. And uh, so I went to your, uh, you know, I went to your st store here in Oslo. Oh, and um, perfect. I've got some of your fries here. Uh, now, I have to admit they are unfortunately cold by now, but what, what is it that characterizes a good fries? Yeah, well, the, it starts with it. it they're best when they're hot, so no sure. surprise. Uh, best when they're hot. But, uh, you know, what, with us, it, it's, the, it's the size of the fry, uh, so it's kind of the, a, a really good uh, biteable size. And then uh, what you like is you like a little bit of the crunch, so you like – sort of the outside of the fry to be crispy and you love the sort of inside of the fry uh, to be sort of nice and, and, and moist. That's uh, our gold standard McDonald's French fry. So if I kind of tear it apart, can you kind of see whether it's your fry or not your fry? Are they, are I, they I, I can tell the difference, yes. Now, I, I must admit I, I'm uh, – an expert, let's just say, uh, when it comes to McDonald's French fries. So, uh, but but yeah, I can tell the difference. And more importantly, I think uh, what we hear from our consumers around the world is they can tell the difference too. Yeah, yeah. So um, perhaps you can spend some time on your kicking off with your products, of course, because that's that's what's driving your growth. So, how do you think about uh, the local versus the the not local choice? Sure. Well, we have kind of a, a little bit of both, as you know. So we have what we call global core menu, which are our kind of iconic classics that every restaurant in the world uh, is required to carry. So that would be something like the Big, the Big Mac, as an example, uh, the French fries, as an example. Those would be global core menu items. Uh, so there's, there's global core menu, but you know, that's probably 15 items uh, or so that uh, the, the, every restaurant around the world is required to carry. And then beyond that, every market has flexibility to add whatever they want, uh, you know, to their own local menu. And I think it's been sort of that combination of these global favorites, uh, but also allowing markets to tailor their menu to what the consumer in that particular geography is looking for. The the balance of that has been, I think, the formula for our success. Mm -hmm. You say that your menu is uh, Darwinian, so basically you sell what people want. Yep. But do people know what's good for them? Well, we certainly try to educate them. And, and we, um, you know, everywhere that uh, whether it's on the app or if you're in the restaurant, we disclose all our nutritional information. So uh, we try to be very transparent uh, about that so that people can make the right choices because uh, on our menu there are a range of, of uh, items everything from uh, indulgent products uh, that you would really have as a treat uh, to those that you can have more regularly so you know we view our role as as being fully transparent uh, and making sure that people can make the right uh, food choices for them but but ultimately the education which I think you're getting to, uh, is is something that, you know, the medical community, uh, schools, all, all of those can play an important role in helping people make the right food choices. Mm. And are you actively trying to switch people's eating habits? Or, should, We're not. or, is, it, or is it your responsibility? How, how do you look at this? Yeah, we don't, we don't really view it as our responsibility, um, in, in part because, th think about this, the, the average – sort of McDonald's user. So in, in markets where we operate, roughly 80% of the consumers in that market visit McDonald's at least once uh, once a year. Uh, our, our sort of average user, so someone who is coming to McDonald's, they're visiting our restaurant three, maybe four times a month. Uh, 
So when you think about the number of other meal occasions that that consumer is having, you know, we are we are getting a fraction of the total meal occasions there. And so, you know, for us to try to assume the mantle of we're going to change the way that somebody is eating when we're seeing, you know, a fraction of their consumption, uh, I think is is beyond what even a, a brand like McDonald's is capable of doing. Mm. Your, your logo, um, the Yellow Arches, are uh, it's one of the most famous logos in the world and most well recognized. What do you what do you want people to feel when they see it? Well, certainly, what, the first thing is is we'd like them to just we, we call it sort of delicious feel good moments. We want them to feel good when they see the Golden Arches because our brand is is inherently meant to be an optimistic brand. It's meant to be a brand. That, that conjures up memories of time with friends, time with family, uh, celebrating milestones, uh, just all sorts of, of the great things that can happen over food. Uh, so when we see when someone sees the golden arches, certainly we want them to feel good, uh, you know, and it conjures up these memories. Uh, but we also want them to think about convenience uh, and the fact that uh, they know that when they come to McDonald's, they're going to be able to get in and get out quickly, and, and then the quality of the food. So all of those, but but it starts with sort of the, at a primal level, we want someone's response to be, uh, you know, connecting to a positive uh, memory bank of, of experiences. Mm. Now, you are um, the biggest employer in the world, I, and I think one out of eight Americans have worked at McDonald's. That's so right. Yep. It, it's a huge responsibility, right? And so how do you think about your people? Well, way back to our founder, uh, he said, you know, at the end of the day, we're a people business and nothing happens in our restaurant without our people. Uh, we have about two million people around the world working in our restaurants. And I think in this day and age, uh, what what we know our people are looking for is first Uh, they're looking to work for a place that that aligns with their values and that they feel good about uh, being a part of that organization. Uh, second, they expect to be compensated and treated fairly. Uh, and and third, I think increasingly what we're also hearing is people, our employees, want uh, us to work with them on flexibility um, and flexibility and providing flexibility in how and when people work Uh, is becoming increasingly important. And so as we try to bring that to life in our restaurants, one of the things that we talk about in all of our restaurants are our core values, uh, our expectations around the, the five core values that we stand for, uh, the, the expectations that that means uh, for how people conduct themselves uh, as an employee, but also what they should expect from us in return. Mm. Uh, and if we fall short uh, or a, a restaurant were to fall short in that, Uh, we try to take corrective measures. The second around uh, being, you know, offering a good economic employee value proposition that goes to wages, that goes to benefits. Uh, we can't attract the people that uh, we need to attract to work in our restaurants unless we're competitive uh, on that. So we spend uh, a fair bit of time uh, on that as well. And then this flexibility point, uh, the technology has helped us uh, to get even better with providing people with flexibility where they can see and swap shifts uh, with their fellow co-workers, what used to be sort of a manual process and having to call around and see if someone could cover your shift or, hey, I, I only want to work, you know, these days of the week. Uh, now with technology, that's all been fully automated. So all of those things go into uh, part of how we attract people into our restaurants. And how long do they stay on average? You know, it varies country to country. Uh, so if you take Italy, for example, I think our turnover rate at, in the restaurant level in Italy uh, is 10%. Uh, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, if you go to the United States, it would be over 100% turnover in a year. So it does very much vary uh, year to year. And, and you you tend to see that there's stratification as well. So you might have Uh, a group of, of people who have worked in a restaurant for a longer period of time. They might be on their way to becoming a shift manager or restaurant general manager. They could, in, in many cases, be in the restaurants for 10 years. And then you have someone who's coming in, tries it for a few weeks and says, ah, this isn't for me or 
something in my life changed and I'm not going to be able to do it. So the, the averages are deceiving because there's quite a, a wide spectrum of, of tenure in a restaurant. Mm. And how do you move people up? I mean, I, I believe you have a hamburger academy. Is that right? We have a hamburger university, university, right, which is sort of our capstone program. So when you become a restaurant general manager, which means that you're running, in essence, you know, a $3 million business or so, uh, that would be in the U.S., the average uh, approximate size of a restaurant, uh, that you would come to Hamburger University and there's all sorts of, of training sessions that we have. And it really, it, it becomes an important part of someone's career uh, at McDonald's when they hit that milestone. Uh, and then, of course, we do all sorts of training in the restaurant as well. Locally, we do training. Uh, and I think that's been one of the reasons why uh, one out of eight people in the U.S. Have, have started their career at McDonald's because beside providing the flexibility, you do learn the basics of business. You learn about how to work as a team. You learn about production flows. You learn learn about customer service. Uh, you learn about, you know, sort of how a P&L works. You learn a lot of the, what I would call, basics of, of business that give you the ability to then either continue in McDonald's uh, and continue working in the restaurants. Many people go on to become franchisees. Or as you know, you know, we have a number of people who have spent time at McDonald's and then go graduate on to do different things. But, but I think McDonald's provides some of those kind of foundational skills that uh, can end up being part of a, a lifelong career. Yeah, some people for sure went on to do different things. I believe uh, Jeff Bezos uh, worked at McDonald's at some stage. He did, yeah. He he still uh, will describe working on the French fry station and uh, is quite proud of his uh, acumen at, at how he was able to very quickly uh, fill a box of fries. Uh, so, you know, you have someone like uh, like Jeff Bezos, David Solomon, at Goldman Sachs has worked uh, at McDonald's uh, way back in the beginning. Uh, that's one of the neat things about this job is is I encounter so many people who are now doing amazing things who will tell me about kind of their earlier experience when they worked at McDonald's. And uh, I think it just and, and part of it is they also go and, and talk about some of the skills that they learned at McDonald's. And that's why uh, we're proud of, of our role as an employer. You have a franchise model. Does that mean that you don't decide uh, the salaries? Uh, the way that a franchise model works, that's correct. We, we do not decide uh, the salaries. That's up to the franchisee. Essentially, a franchisee is running their own business. And what they are uh, licensing from us is they're licensing uh, our trademark, which is the McDonald's logo. They're licensing our, our core equities. And then they're also getting with it a whole suite of support services uh, that we provide to help them run great restaurants. But ultimately, Part of the reason that we are in a franchise model is we want local entrepreneurs. We want people who have that pride of ownership, uh, who feel like uh, this is a business that, that they own and that they're driving. And so, yes, the people are their people. Uh, they hire them. They, they determine the pay and salaries. Now, we share all sorts of information. So they, of course, understand where they are relative to the market. They understand where they are relative to uh, each other. Uh, but the decision ultimately on how they uh, attract the people they need for the restaurant is up to the franchisee. Mm -hmm. Talking a bit about sustainability. So you are the biggest buyer of beef in the world, uh, potatoes, uh, one of the biggest user of um, you know, plastic products, uh, and so on. So how, what are the challenges, what are the most important challenges you are seeing now on the sustainability side? I think on sustainability, because it, it we have one such a global footprint, uh, and two, uh, we are pretty rigorous about our expectations. It's it's ensuring that uh, all the way across the supply chain that we have visibility into that. So, you you're right. We we are uh, we sell more beef than anybody else. We sell more potatoes than anybody else. But the interesting thing is. We don't own any of our supply chain. So we don't own the farms. We don't own the uh, manufacturing facilities. All of that is done with us through a network of suppliers uh, across the world. And we have a great group of suppliers. What we do is we make sure that we're clear about 
uh, the expectation. So what McDonald's does is we set standards. We set standards around, for example, all palm oil has to be uh, responsibly sourced. None of it can come from deforestation. And we have audit procedures out there to make sure that uh, anybody who is providing us with palm oil is complying with our standards. When it comes to beef, we have uh, very strict uh, standards around deforestation and making sure that none of the cattle is coming from land that was deforested. And we have different ways that we oversee that. So we're, we're setting the standards uh, with that. And of course, part of how we set the standards is we get to select who our suppliers are. Uh, and so typically we uh, are working with the best of the best. And I would say in 99% of the cases, our suppliers are wanting to do the same things yeah. that we're doing, that we're wanting to do. They, they live on the same planet uh, that we do. They see the challenges that we see. Uh, and so the, what we work together on is how do we make sure that we're working together responsibly, but at the same time, uh, there's, you know, seven, eight billion people in the world uh, that need to be fed. And, and how do you do that in a responsible, sustainable manner? Mm -hmm. So... There is competition out there. You have other people, uh, you know, flipping burgers. Uh, I know another big company, for instance. What um, what is it that you do better than them? I I'd say, you know, our focus has always been in the beginning quality, service, and convenience. Uh, QSC we call it. Uh, actually, QSC and V, uh, which is is the last part is value. Uh, so that that has been our playbook uh, from the very beginning. It was something Ray Kroc, when he founded the company, he, he talked about QSC and V as being uh, the foundation. And what we try to do is just do the very best job we can on each of those dimensions. And it, it might sound a little bit odd, but we, we don't actually spend a ton of time uh, benchmarking ourselves to our competitors We spend a lot more time benchmarking ourselves to our own internal standards uh, and how we're doing. And we are the, the thing I love about this business is the amount of data that you can get in this business is unbelievable. We, we get data by restaurant, by hour, by customer. Uh, and we get a lot of feedback, as you would imagine, then from our customers telling us either we're doing a great job or, hey, I didn't have a great experience. And so when we're thinking about our performance, we're typically relying a lot on, the, on that own internal data uh, to identify areas that we can get better. And you know, our belief is that we have structural advantages in this business. And so long as we are executing our, against our QSC and V, uh, that the structural advantages for us are gonna be uh, what protect us. Uh, and it's just about delighting the consumer. Chris, tell me about some of the coolest uh, data you have and how you use some of these analytics. Because uh, looking back, I think, for instance, Ray Kwok, he, he counted the, the amount of sesame seeds on, on each yeah. bun and that kind of thing. Just, yeah. What, what are you doing? Well, I'll give you an example. If, if you went back a few years ago, uh, imagine if you're running a restaurant. So imagine you're that restaurant general manager. And the way that our, that we our kitchens work Uh, let's say it's it's 11.30 in the mor morning and you're getting ready for the lunchtime rush. The question you have to answer for yourself is, okay, I know lunchtime rush is about to come. How do I get prepared for that lunchtime rush? So how many hamburgers do I think I'm going to sell? Am I going to be selling the quarter pounder? Am I going to be selling the Big Mac? Am I, how many chicken nuggets am I going to be selling? You know, it's the whole range of items and you're trying to figure out How much am I going to be selling? And you're trying to get it all prepared in advance. So you're trying to stage it so that you're ready to go. Well, that all of that work in the past was really done sort of through the intuition and experience of the restaurant general manager. Uh, and now, because of something we have called e-production, uh, essentially we know, based on the history of that restaurant, exactly what they need to stage by every 15-minute increment throughout the day. So we'll, you'll see a screen that will pop up in the restaurant, which will say, okay, it's 11.30. Time for you to now make eight hamburgers, do you know, a, a basket of chicken nuggets, and have you know, a fresh batch of fries. And oh, by the way, you're going to get these three other orders as well. 
Uh, all of that is informed by what we have as just the historical data. So we take some of the guesswork out of it, and it's it's what you would, in a manufacturing parlance, you would describe as a, a standard SNOP process and sales and operations planning process, where we're much with through, through data, we're much better able to predict what we need to be making, and ultimately the benefit to the consumer means that they have a faster experience, so they don't have to wait. You know, if we don't have something ready, we typically then have to make it on demand, which requires the consumer to wait. But also because we're, we're making it in advance um, and it's syncing up with what the consumer is looking for, it means the product's going to be hot and fresh when they get it. And it's not going to be something that's been sitting around for, you know, 15 minutes or something like that. Yeah, your, your colleagues in Oslo clearly had it today ready in no time. So um, you should be really proud of them. Oh, good. Yeah, they um, do a great and, job up there. <laughs> how, but, and how do you think artificial intelligence will take this further? It, it's a great question. And there are so many different use cases that we can think of with artificial intelligence. Start with uh, where you started our conversation, which is with our people. And think about uh, the training that goes on to train two million people Uh, on our procedures. Every time you launch uh, a, a limited time only offer products, so something that maybe is only going to be in the in the restaurant for four weeks or so, you have to do training on that. So there's a vast amount of training that happens. And one of the things that happens with artificial intelligence is you now have an ability to get to much more customized training in someone's local language And they're able through interaction uh, to be able to progress through the training at the pace that makes sense for them. So as opposed to a one size fits all training experience, you'd be able to offer something that's much more customized. That would just be one example. Certainly as you're also getting vast amounts of consumer data, uh, we get about 65 million people a day visiting our restaurants. Uh, we're collecting uh, data on roughly, you know, a third of those people are are volunteering to be self-identified. Uh, you can then start to customize, imagine driving up through the drive through and imagine that maybe the drive through menu board changes uh, because we know that when you typically come to McDonald's, these are the items that you uh, like to buy. And so now uh, you have a menu board that maybe is customized to you as opposed to just being a menu board that everybody sees. So you can go on and on and on with all the different potential use cases. I, I think our challenge, like every company, is going to be prioritizing and deciding which ones do we want to be sort of on the leading edge of, uh, which ones do we want to be a fast follower, and then where do we want to be insourcing some of those capabilities versus what we would typically do is where are we outsourcing those capabilities. But I think there's no doubt that in our industry over the next, call it five years, you're going to see Uh, a pretty significant impact from AI, as I think probably is going to happen across industries uh, around the world. I think you opened your first uh, fully automated restaurant in Texas uh, recently. How does that How does that work? Yeah, it's not quite fully automated because we still do have people working uh, in the kitchen. But uh, the automation uh, is there's there's no uh, lobby. Uh, it's all drive-through, uh, or it's it's uh, a curbside pickup, uh, and this is all about just again providing convenience to the customer. We're seeing, especially post-COVID, that one of the things that is enduring is this on-the-go component. So whether it's delivery, whether it's drive-through, whether it's using digital and having someone bring the food out, you know, people are looking to eat on the go, and this restaurant that we have in Texas. Uh, without a dining room is is meant to see how far we can push the envelope uh, on providing that sort of experience. But I think I, I get asked all the time, you know, do I see a day where there aren't going to be any people working in our restaurant? And uh, the answer to that is no. I, I don't see that certainly in, in my career horizon being uh, something that's going to happen at McDonald's. We're always going to need people uh, to provide that great service, that great hospitality, Um, but I do think that there are important things that we can do uh, where you have technology, where you have AI as a co-pilot uh, to make the job easier, to take stress uh, out of the restaurant. I think that's going to be where you see it over the next few years. Mm -hmm. If you were to try to distill down the corporate culture and the essence of 
the McDonald ways of doing things, what, what would it be? Well, we talk about a few things uh, as being sort of what we would describe as, as cultural norms. Uh, one is, is this notion of uh, ruthlessly prioritizing. And there are so many opportunities for us, uh, so many different things that we can do, but we can't do everything and we can't do everything well. And so we have to uh, be able to prioritize. Uh, and that's something that I would say is an ongoing struggle, but but we are we're very mindful of it, and we spend a lot of time here at a company uh, about prioritization. So that's that's one thing uh, that we do. I think another thing that we we try to focus on is uh, discuss and not present. So we want to not we we don't want to be a PowerPoint heavy presentation uh, organization. We want it to be about discussion. We want it to be about uh, debating ideas. Uh, and so that's another thing that we try to make sure the way we run ourselves, we, the way we conduct ourselves, uh, is it's, it's a, a place where we encourage debate, where we allow for debate, um, but it's done in, in, I think, a very constructive manner. And that goes to, I think, another one of the core features of our, of our business and our culture is collaboration. The fact that we're a franchise business, uh, we have 5,000 franchisees around the world, the fact that we don't own our own supply chain, that we have to work with our suppliers, all of that puts a premium on being a great collaborator because uh, we don't control a lot of it. It's about influencing and getting other people to align to a vision and then bringing it to life. Uh, and then the final piece is, is about inclusion for us. And if you think about the, the fact that we serve roughly 80% of the population uh, if you go into a McDonald's, uh, you see everybody. You yeah. see young, old, different ethnicities, different races, rich, poor, et cetera. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do a great job of serving all of those different customers if we didn't have within our own organization diversity as well that reflected all those different experiences and, and different wants and needs. So the final thing that I'd say is defining about our culture is, is just uh, – a focus on inclusion uh, that that we've been on uh, for forty some odd years. Frankly, it, we were on it way before the, the whole notion of DEI uh, came about because it's so core to what we do. Mm. You have a Catholic background. I know you talk about doing the right thing. What is that? Well, so I do have a Catholic background, and and uh, one of the things that you learn about in, in Catholicism is the golden rule, which is do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Uh, and, and I think if you approach things from that way, uh, that's a pretty good starting point. Uh, the other thing for, for me is that I, I want to be able to be proud of the company that I work for, no different than someone who's working in the restaurant. Um, and because I'm the face of the company as the CEO, uh, I, I get sort of an extra amount of that. And so I want to be able to make sure that when I go out and represent McDonald's, when I go out and represent our 5,000 franchisees, our 2 million people, uh, that I can talk about our company in a way that makes all of them proud and makes me feel proud uh, as well. So that that for me is, is how it comes to life. Um, and, and people... People can see through if you're not authentic. Uh, you've got to really believe it uh, to be able to, to evangelize on those things. And I feel very privileged and very proud of, about my association with McDonald's. And, and I, one thing I know about our company is we are trying to do uh, the right thing. Mm -hmm. You've been um, in this industry pretty much your whole life. Uh, previously worked with, uh, with Pepsi and Kraft. What is it that is so interesting with this industry? This, sorry, I'll repeat this. Um, now, you've been in this industry your whole life, previously worked with Pepsi and Kraft. What is it that attracts you to this industry? What I love about this industry is the, the focus on the consumer. And I'm someone who likes to have a very tangible product. Uh, so I like the, the feedback that you get uh, immediately when, when someone tries your product and says, hey, I either love it or I don't love it. Uh, that, for me, is something that's very gratifying. I think another thing that uh, that I really enjoy about this industry is uh, these are all iconic brands 
that no matter where I go in the world and no matter what brand I've worked on, uh, people have a story uh, that they're willing to tell you about it and how that br- how your brand somehow or another fit into their life. Uh, and that's always a neat thing to hear from somebody is just, uh, you know, how, how your brand is, is part of someone's life. So that's something. And I, I think finally, it's just there, there's so many great people in this industry and uh, you, you don't work in an industry, you don't work uh, in a company like McDonald's for, for the number of years that I've now worked here uh, if you don't love the people that you're with. And uh, I've just uh, been very fortunate to, to work with some amazing people, to have some amazing mentors over the years. And uh, that's what keeps me doing it. Hmm. What, are your most in, what are your most important leadership principles? I think one of the things that I uh, certainly expect is uh, tone at the top. Uh, and, and so a, a recognition that uh, as a leader of an organization, you will set the culture. And I do think that over time, uh, the the culture of an organization does come to reflect the tone that's coming out of the CEO's office. Uh, so the most important thing for me is that I set the right tone at the top, and that goes to our values that I talked about previously. It goes to our cultural norms. You know, there's a bunch of ways that you bring that to life, but but it starts with setting the right tone uh, at the top in, in the company. I think the other thing is to be able to speak with clarity. Uh, the organization needs to understand the vision. They need to understand where we're going. They need to understand how they can contribute to that, what their role is going to be. So you have to be a very good communicator uh, and do it a number of different ways, but make sure that everybody understands uh, the direction, why we're going that way, and what the potential benefits uh, of all this uh, is. And then ultimately, you have to be a great listener because the nature and scope of these jobs, uh, I, I touch one fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the things that happen in McDonald's every single day. Everybody in the company is more of an expert in their area than I am in mine. My job is to synthesize sort of all their thinking and ideas and, and be able to stitch it together in a way that makes sense. And so creating an environment where people are willing to tell you sometimes the uncomfortable truths, where they're willing to challenge your ideas, uh, all of that goes to ultimately, I think, creating a, a great organization and, and one that can be successful in the long term. Is it possible to give us some examples of the tone from the top? And for instance, what are the what are the parts of the corporate culture you are trying to tweak just now and how do you do it? Yeah. One thing I, I'm trying to change is uh, what I have described as vertical thinking versus horizontal thinking. And vertical thinking is when people tend to look at their job or they look at their their project through the lens of either their function. So if I'm supply chain, I'm only thinking about it as a supply chain leader, or they're thinking about it through their ge- geographic lens. So if I'm in Canada running the Canadian business, I'm only thinking about it from a Canadian perspective, as opposed to thinking about things horizontally, where you're thinking about how might what I'm doing here, how does that connect to other people in the organization And how am I bringing them along? Because the reality is there isn't a single project that happens at McDonald's that can happen with only one function. Everything that we do inherently is multifunctional. Just it's the nature of everything. And if you think about our business as well, there's so much commonality in our business. There's so much opportunity to learn that if you're only thinking about your geography and you're not opening up your horizon, your aperture, to think about what are other markets doing? What can I learn? You know, back to the, the cultural norms. Another one I talk about is steal shamelessly. Uh, and so before you embark on something, the first question you should be asking is, okay, who else has done this before? And what can I learn from them? Because 90% of the time, I guarantee you, the issue that you're facing, we have faced somewhere else in McDonald's already. And, and so th- start with a horizontal mindset before you drop into a vertical mindset. That's one thing that I've been preaching quite a bit uh, over the last six months in our organization. What's the best thing you've stolen from other organizations? I mean, stolen. Uh, yeah, 
Copy. Uh, I'd I'd say uh, I've been fortunate. I started my career at Procter and Gamble uh, as a brand manager there, and I think P and G does a a spectacular job around talent development and succession planning. Uh, that's been something that I've tried to uh, bring to McDonald's is uh, and PepsiCo as well. I think PepsiCo is another one that's a standout from a talent development succession planning standpoint. Uh, I've tried to bring those ideas, those processes, those tools, uh, and and bring them to McDonald's because I do think back to this point of we're a people business. It means that we're going to be only as good as the pipeline of talent that we have uh, two, three layers down in the organization, and uh, that's been something that I have uh, unapologetically stolen from. Uh, other organizations that I've been a part of and that we're getting embedded here at McDonald's. And specifically, what's the key to good succession planning? I think it starts with a, a few different things. It starts with uh, having clarity about what are the critical experiences that someone needs for different jobs. Um, if you're not clear about to be successful in this role, Here's the experiences that, that this person would need to have to be successful in that role. You're kind of in the dark then when you're doing succession planning. So it starts with having clarity about the experiences that are needed to be successful in that role. That's part one. I think the second thing is having a very realistic but also aligned point of view with the, the employee about their strengths and opportunities. Uh, what are they good at? Where where do they have their development opportunities? And then it's the marrying of the two. It's the marrying of when an opportunity comes up, of all the people that I've got to choose from, how might this fit with someone's development opportunity? Do they bring to it also the critical experiences that that they need? And and ideally, you're doing it multi years out, so you're not doing it just when the job comes open. You're actually for every single job especially at the more senior levels, every single job, you're building a slate that says in the next one to three years, here's what this looks like. In the next four to six years, here's who, here are people that we might consider for this role so that you've got sort of a longer term view and, and a strategy that you're executing against versus what I see sometimes that happens uh, if you don't have that kind of robust process is it tends to be much more reactive, much more reflexive Hey, somebody you know quit. Somebody moved to a different job. Okay, who do we have? Uh, and, and it's it's not a strategic decision. It's more of an availability decision. And when you're thinking about it that way, uh, you're ultimately not going to be building the bench of your organization in the future. Mm. Did you learn anything important at Harvard Business School? I learned a lot of things there. It was a great experience for me. One, one of the things that I learned uh, about it is just. You you meet people from so many different industries and from so many different countries. Uh, it opened up my my worldview of everything that's out there. Uh, so I, I think the one thing is just a much more expansive horizon uh, of all the different career paths that are out there. But also, uh, there's a lot of talented people. What, one thing that you learn when you go to Harvard Business School is no matter how good you think you are, you're not that good. Uh, Because you meet a lot of other people that uh, you know are, are pretty impressive, and uh, it's it's a humbling experience uh, for sure. Um, but I, th I think for me also, it's just the richness of those experiences. And I, I've kept in touch with many of my uh, HBS classmates, and none of them are working in my industry. Uh, and I get to hear about the different things that they're doing. And also, as you know, as you go on in life. It becomes less about the job that you're doing. It becomes more about just family and, you know, what, how are you doing personally? And, and that, for me, has been another great part of my association with Harvard Business School is uh, beside the professional development is just the, the lifelong friendships that I've been able to, to get out of that. Jensen uh, Huang of NVIDIA said, uh, Nikolai, you have a hard work and then you have insanely hard work. Uh, how would you define your work ethics? I think you go through uh, through peaks and valleys on that. So I, I wouldn't say that it is uh, at a steady state. There are going to be periods where it, you are 
extremely hardworking and where it, it can become sort of all consuming. And then there will be other times uh, where you don't have that. I, I think from my vantage point, uh, the way I think about myself, you know, I've my success has been largely through hard work. I, I would say I'm not the smartest person in the world. I'm not the most charismatic person in the world. When you go to Harvard Business School uh, and when you work at the companies that I work at, I've worked at, uh, I've seen plenty of people who are better on some of those dimensions uh, than I than I am. I think for me, what I've uh, you know been able to do, I think in my career, is uh, I've got a good balance of skills. So I've, I've got a good uh, ability to take kind of risk, but also think through things. I've got good communication skills. So I, I think a balance of those uh, abilities paired with uh, a willingness to do the hard work. Uh, because to get to be a you know CEO of a company like uh, like McDonald's, it doesn't happen in your first five years out of business school. It doesn't happen in your first fifteen years out of business school. In, in my case, it's twenty five years uh, after business school that you get into that sort of role. A- and so along the way, there's got to be a lot of learning. There's got to be a lot of of experiences and hard work. Uh, and ultimately, as you well know, Nikolai, uh, you you develop a reputation uh, in your industry. Uh, you become a brand unto yourself where Chris is known for being this type of person. And uh, I, I'm I, th- I think, you know, over my years uh, sort of developed a, a brand, uh, someone who's strategic, but also who's a good listener uh, and is able to do the hard work and, and do it in the right way. So relentlessly slaving away. Well, probably no different than you or anybody else, but yes. <laughs> How do you relax? I gather you run uh, marathons and all that kind of stuff. Well, yes, I, I've, I've run a bunch of those. As I get older, I'm, I'm going to run less of those. Uh, you know, the body uh, can only take so much uh, of the pounding on that. But I love sports. I, I'd say I start with I love sports. I love being outdoors. Uh, those are all great things for me. And I've got a great family. Uh, that I just I love being around, uh, and I've got a great group of friends that also uh, I enjoy being around. And uh, you find you know you need to get the balance from that because at the end of the day there will be a day that I'm no longer CEO of McDonald's, uh, and uh, with that go all the sort of you know trappings of the role. Uh, and what you're back to is your friends, your family, uh, you know the things that you care about. Uh, and so I, I always try to keep that in mind as well and make sure that I, I don't over index uh, because in the long run, I, I think I have a pretty good idea of what really matters. What do you read? Well, I tend to like nonfiction books. Uh, so I, I, I typically read more nonfiction than fiction, although right now I'm reading a book called The Wager, uh, which is sort of a uh, nonfiction book. It's a story about a, a British frigate, a, man, a British man of war that was sent to South America to take on the Spanish Armada. And the author is uh, sort of reimagining what happened uh, during this voyage where there was a shipwreck and there was mutiny and there's all sorts of different stories. So uh, I, I do tend to like things that have, uh, you know, an essence of, of uh, history to them. Uh, nonfiction, like I said, is also something that uh, that I tend to enjoy. Mm. Now, we have tens of thousands of uh, young people listening into to the program here. What would be your advice to them? I, I think the first is just to, to not settle. And what I see sometimes people hap- happen in their career is they start to settle for, you know, either this is, you know, as high as I'm going to go, or yeah, I don't love my job, but I'm I'm, it pays well, and I don't really want to move, and uh, and so you end up seeing that that people will maybe make some settle for things, and I don't think you should settle. I, I think you know people should set high expectations for what they want to get out of life, what they want to get out of their career. Uh, so so it starts with one, don't settle. I think the second thing is surround yourself, be around good people. Uh, so much of the opportunities that I've gotten uh, 
the coaching that I've gotten over the years has been because of the relationships and just the people that I've been around. Uh, and when you're around good people, people that you like, people that you trust, uh, that's going to be helpful for you in your career. If you're working in a place and, and you uh, don't love the people, that should be a red light uh, for you that, that maybe this isn't the right place for you. Uh, so you got to make sure that you're around people that, that you like. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is make sure you're constantly learning, uh, especially these days where the world, I think, is changing so quickly. Uh, if, if you're not, if you don't have a learner's mindset, if you are not inherently curious every single day trying to learn about something new, uh, I think you can find yourself becoming quickly outdated uh, in certain areas. Uh, and so having that learner's mindset, being relentlessly curious about stuff uh, and being willing to take action on it. You know, when you find something that maybe you discover through your, your investigation that seems really interesting, it's one thing to say, hey, that seems really interesting. It's another to say, and you know what, I'm going to go do X, Y, Z about it. Uh, and that goes back to the don't settle. I think it's a fantastic place to end. Uh, I certainly have learned a lot from you today. Uh, big thanks for sharing and uh, all the best going forward. Well, thanks so much for having me, Nikolai. It's my pleasure. Thank you.